Sorrow will not help us. We are all doing our best, and Mother's smile, perchance, might even inspire us to do better. Day by day we are strengthened for these tasks by our hope of better days ahead. His sturdy and practical optimism was truly contagious. All the children lived in an atmosphere of anticipation of better times and better things, and this hopeful courage contributed mightily to the development of strong and noble characters in spite of the depressiveness of their poverty. Jesus possessed the ability effectively to mobilize all his powers of mind, soul, and body on the task immediately in hand. He could concentrate his deep-thinking mind on the one problem which he wished to solve, and this, in connection with his untiring patience, enabled him serenely to endure the trials of a difficult mortal existence, to live as if he were seeing him who is invisible. 4. The Nineteenth Year, A.D. 13 by this time Jesus and Mary were getting along much better. She regarded him less as a son. He had become to her more a father to her children. Each day's life swarmed with practical and immediate difficulties. Less frequently they spoke of his life work, for as time passed, all their thought was mutually devoted to the support and upbringing of their family of four boys and three girls. By the beginning of this year, Jesus had fully won his mother to the acceptance of his methods of child training, the positive injunction to do good in the place of the older Jewish method of forbidding to do evil. In his home and throughout his public teaching career, Jesus invariably employed the positive form of exhortation. Always and everywhere did he say, You shall do this, you ought to do that. Never did he employ the negative mode of teaching derived from the ancient taboos. He refrained from placing emphasis on evil by forbidding it, while he exalted the good by commanding its performance. Prayer time in this household was the occasion for discussing anything and everything related to the welfare of the family. Jesus began wise discipline upon his brothers and sisters at such an early age that little or no punishment was ever required to secure their prompt and wholehearted obedience. The only exception was Jude, upon whom on sundry occasions Jesus found it necessary to impose penalties for his infractions of the rules of the home. On three occasions, when it was deemed wise to punish Jude for self-confessed and deliberate violations of the family rules of conduct, his punishment was fixed by the unanimous decree of the older children, and was assented to by Jude himself before it was inflicted. While Jesus was most methodical and systematic in everything he did, there was also in all his administrative rulings a refreshing elasticity of interpretation and an individuality of adaptation that greatly impressed all the children with the spirit of justice which actuated their father-brother. He never arbitrarily disciplined his brothers and sisters, and such uniform fairness and personal consideration greatly endeared Jesus to all his family. James and Simon grew up trying to follow Jesus' plan of placating their bellicose and sometimes irate playmates by persuasion and non-resistance, and they were fairly successful. But Joseph and Jude, while assenting to such teachings at home, made haste to defend themselves when assailed by their comrades. In particular was Jude guilty of violating the spirit of these teachings. But non-resistance was not a rule of the family. No penalty was attached to the violation of personal teachings. In general, all of the children, particularly the girls, would consult Jesus about their childhood troubles and confide in him just as they would have an affectionate father. James was growing up to be a well-balanced and even-tempered youth, but he was not so spiritually inclined as Jesus. He was a much better student than Joseph, who, while a faithful worker, was even less spiritually minded. Joseph was a plotter and not up to the intellectual level of the other children. Simon was a well-meaning boy, but too much of a dreamer. He was slow in getting settled down in life and was the cause of considerable anxiety to Jesus and Mary. But he was always a good and well-intentioned lad. Jude was a firebrand. He had the highest of ideals, but he was unstable in temperament. He had all and more of his mother's determination and aggressiveness, but he lacked much of her sense of proportion and discretion. Miriam was a well-balanced and level-headed daughter with a keen appreciation of things noble and spiritual. Martha was slow in thought and action, but a very dependable and efficient child. Baby Ruth was the sunshine of the home. Though thoughtless of speech, she was most sincere of heart. She just about worshipped her big brother and father. But they did not spoil her. She was a beautiful child, but not quite so comely as Miriam, who was the belle of the family, if not of the city. 
As time passed, Jesus did much to liberalize and modify the family teachings and practices related to Sabbath observance and many other phases of religion, and to all these changes Mary gave hearty assent. By this time Jesus had become the unquestioned head of the house. This year Jude started to school, and it was necessary for Jesus to sell his harp in order to defray these expenses. Thus disappeared the last of his recreational pleasures. He much loved to play the harp when tired in mind and weary in body, but he comforted himself with the thought that at least the harp was safe from seizure by the tax collector. 5. Rebecca, the daughter of Ezra Although Jesus was poor, his social standing in Nazareth was in no way impaired. He was one of the foremost young men of the city and very highly regarded by most of the young women. Since Jesus was such a splendid specimen of robust and intellectual manhood, and considering his reputation as a spiritual leader, it was not strange that Rebekah, the eldest daughter of Ezra, a wealthy merchant and trader of Nazareth, should discover that she was slowly falling in love with this son of Joseph. She first confided her affection to Miriam, Jesus' sister, and Miriam in turn talked all this over with her mother. Mary was intensely aroused. Was she about to lose her son, now become the indispensable head of the family? Would troubles never cease? What next could happen? And then she paused to contemplate what effect marriage would have upon Jesus' future career. Not often, but at least sometimes, did she recall the fact that Jesus was a child of promise. After she and Miriam had talked this matter over, they decided to make an effort to stop it before Jesus learned about it, by going direct to Rebecca laying the whole story before her and honestly telling her about their belief that Jesus was a son of destiny, that he was to become a great religious teacher, perhaps the Messiah. Rebecca listened intently. She was thrilled with the recital and more than ever determined to cast her lot with this man of her choice and to share his career of leadership. She argued to herself that such a man would all the more need a faithful and efficient wife. She interpreted Mary's efforts to dissuade her as a natural reaction to the dread of losing the head and sole support of her family, but knowing that her father approved of her attraction for the carpenter's son, she rightly reckoned that he would gladly supply the family with sufficient income fully to compensate for the loss of Jesus' earnings. When her father agreed to such a plan, Rebecca had further conferences with Mary and Miriam, and when she failed to win their support, she made bold to go directly to Jesus. This she did with the cooperation of her father, who invited Jesus to their home for the celebration of Rebecca's seventeenth birthday. Jesus listened attentively and sympathetically to the recital of these things, first by the father, then by Rebecca herself. He made kindly reply to the effect that no amount of money could take the place of his obligation personally to rear his father's family, to fulfill the most sacred of all human trusts, loyalty to one's own flesh and blood. Rebecca's father was deeply touched by Jesus' words of family devotion and retired from the conference. His only remark to Mary, his wife, was, We can't have him for a son. He is too noble for us. Then began that eventful talk with Rebecca. Thus far in his life, Jesus had made little distinction in his association with boys and girls, with young men and young women. His mind had been altogether too much occupied with the pressing problems of practical earthly affairs and the intriguing contemplation of his eventual career about his father's business ever to have given serious consideration to the consummation of personal love in human marriage. But now he was face to face with another of those problems which every average human being must confront and decide. Indeed, he was tested in all points, like as you are. After listening attentively, he sincerely thanked Rebecca for her expressed admiration, adding, It shall cheer and comfort me all the days of my life. He explained that he was not free to enter into relations with any woman other than those of simple brotherly regard and pure friendship. He made it clear that his first and paramount duty was the rearing of his father's family, that he could not consider marriage until that was accomplished. And then he added, If I am a son of destiny, I must not assume obligations of lifelong duration until such a time as my destiny shall be made manifest. Rebecca was heartbroken. She refused to be comforted and importuned her father to leave Nazareth until he finally consented to move to Sephoris. In after years, to the many men who sought her hand in marriage, Rebecca had but one answer. She lived 